the world's only, you know, the biggest superpower, the master of commerce and trade, a country that established, you know, the sun never sets on the British Empire, for them to lose. This, this is the first real battle that they lost. And it marked kind of, if you look back, historically, it kind of marked the, the descendancy of their imperialistic, you mm. know, kind of dominance over the planet, over commerce, which then affected... The South Pole. The wow. South Pole, losing the race to the South Pole. But the reason I'm bringing that up, you have to take yourself back to that time. In 1911, 1912, it was as big a deal to get to the South Pole as it was 50 years later to get to the moon. That was, really? Yes, it was a huge source of national pride. In fact, when they died, the guys that died, they knew they were going to die and freeze to death. They wrote it like, we did it for God, for for um, uh, for England, and for our families or something like that. And he said, please, God, take care of our families. Mm. Like, his order was family, God, and England. And that was what he was doing it for. It was national pride. It was a huge source of national pride. Think about all the things that we have in, in like, why is New York so important to the whole world? Because it's a source of commerce, it's a source of of, of uh, transportation, it's an international city. Um, it's it's a source of pride to the country, right? It's the biggest city on on, on uh, in, in America, not not in the northern uh, North America, but it's the biggest city in uh, in America. And so it's a capital, financial capital, population count. It's an incredibly important place. Mm -hmm. Um, we take pride in it. That's why it's is controversial when you have a mayor who wants to do certain things and maybe take down the prestige of the city or whatever, the economic base of it. So that's people get upset about it. It's a source of pride for you, right? You don't want to see it go bad. Uh, your team, your Philly, uh, Philadelphia, Philly, the source of pride. Like It's a city. It's something that you do. It's, it's sort of nationalistic. It's built into human beings as a tribal species. Yes. Getting to the, the moon was just like that. I mean, you you can si sort of also uh, glean that fact from the... from the observation that there was only one other country that plausibly could have gotten there around the same time, and that was the Soviets, right? Mm -hmm. the, the former Soviet Union. They were the only ones that had the capability. When they were uh, kind of depleted economically at the end of the Cold War, um, and just by virtue of being a communistic, bloated country, on the verge of eventual collapse just 20 years later. I mean, it, it collapsed 20 years later. Um, and that was on a downswing. They realized that part of what why the U.S. wanted to go there is to bankrupt them. You know, it was basically force their hand. They were so, um, and a lot of people think this was a legitimate conspiracy. You know, oh. all conspiracies are wrong. Like you and I can conspire oh, to go, yeah. go yeah, to dinner yeah. tonight. That doesn't mean that they're evil or whatever. Part of the uh, U.S. military's conspiracy was like, oh, we can outspend them into bankruptcy by <laughs> making it so important to their source of national pride and what communism and all these things mean, like Soyuz and Union. And it's like their national flag was the name of their first, uh, you know, Sputnik and, and so forth. Those are all the names of very p important concepts in social and communism. So for them, it was not only their country, but it was the whole notion, economic notion of, of communism and spreading that kind of uh, doctrine worldwide and the hegemony of the communist uh, society so around the world. So force them to Basically, have to yeah. try to do that. Our chess move, yeah. you know, like the worst thing that you can have in a battle, according to our mutual friend that you connect with me, Andrew Bustamante, is to <laughs> psychologically allow your enemy to force every single move that you do. Like right yes. now in Iran, Israel's so far in their heads, they can't even use like the internet or email. They can't use anything electronic or communicating on paper. Like that, and, and Israel knows that. And so they know there's going to be a lag between when an order is given and when the order is not, uh, you know, actually enacted upon. So they can now operate at any level that they want. They're actually controlling the enemy, even though they're not like forcing them with a gun to their head, to the Ayatollah's head, they're still able to control exactly what they're doing, more or less. And that's why they didn't mount any Broke kind of attack. Legs. They knew exactly what they were going to do in the attack on the Qatar base and stuff, right? The U.S. was in the Soviets' head just like that. And mm. they had people operating in our government. They had spies that stole the nuclear technology for the A-bomb, um, uh, for, for the you know, hydrogen bomb. Uh, you know, they did both ways. I mean, it wasn't just like we were the only ones that had a spy. Uh, obviously, we fought this 50-year-long Cold War with them, but eventually they collapsed, right? Um, so part of this was the, the search for national grandeur. And back then, by the way, Norway wasn't like some country the way it is now and like part of NATO or whatever and just like a trade. They were kind of like a vassal of the Soviet Union in some ways and and they had their own kind of designs on power in the Nordic, you know, countries over Sweden. Um, you know, Sweden's also, you know, is a huge economic, it's actually bigger than Norway um, now, but but back then it was kind of like one giant country and they they had sort of aims on becoming an economic superpower themselves. And so to for England, the world's only, you know, the biggest superpower, the master of commerce and trade, a country that established, you know, the sun never sets on the British Empire, for them to lose. 
this, this is the first real battle that they lost. And it marked kind of, if you look back historically, it kind of marked the, the descendancy of their imperialistic, you mm. know, kind of dominance over the planet, over commerce, which then affected the South Pole, the wow. South Pole losing the race to the South Pole. Wow. So this is a long-winded way of saying it's entirely plausible that the, and actually it was easier for them to reach the South Pole than to reach, go to the moon. I mean, there were other countries involved that could have gotten, the U.S. could have gotten to the South Pole. In fact, we flew over the South Pole, Admiral Byrd flew over the South Pole in a plane, yeah. you know, only a couple of dozen years after the plane was invented. Um, you know, so we could have done it probably. So there were other countries, but the moon landing, only two countries could have done it. One was being economically crippled by the other one. And by its own policies and communism in general tends to do that. And because of that, they it's entirely plausible to me that they didn't reach it. And the fact that they also had these lunar probes. Remember I said my friend Tom Murphy shoots lasers or did shoot lasers to measure the, the distance to the moon with the precision of one millimeter in order mm -hmm. to test theories of gravity. See, Julian, there's a concept called dark matter. You've probably heard of it. Yes. We're going to so talk dark, about that. Yeah, we so should talk about that. Now. Dark matter is this mysterious substance or perhaps, remember, you always have to have an alternative explanation. You can't just go so deep into your explanation that it can only be UFOs or it can only be quantum gravity or it can only be a theory of everything or it can only be dark matter. Right now, the leading candidate that explains why galaxies behave in the certain peculiar way that they behave is that there's a cloud of massive particles that don't interact with photons. Mm. And there are examples of those that we already know about that we detect called neutrinos. Neutrinos are massive. They have tiny, tiny masses, the lightest masses of the elementary particles, the 17 elementary particles. Three of them are neutrinos. They have masses below 0.1 electron volt, where the electron is the most massive, uh, most least massive particle whose mass we know. We don't know the exact mass of the neutrino yet. We hope to do that with the Simons Observatory and other projects. Uh, we can talk about how we're going to do that. Um, but it's it's not like this chunk of meteorite that you get at my website. Uh, because this meteorite is dark in space. If there's no sun or light around it, it appears dark. And it affects gravitationally the trajectory of other objects around it via Newton's, uh, Newton's laws of gravitation, right? It has mass and it can affect things gravitationally. Well, dark matter is just like this, except you can't see it. It should really be called invisible matter mm. because it's massive. Um, but it's transparent. You really can't see it. You can't see through it. You can't detect it. You can't do anything with it. It's not like this that just doesn't glow on its yes. own accord. So that's dark matter, what we call dark matter. But there's an alternative explanation for dark matter, which is that, oh, no, 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 there's no such thing as dark matter because a lot of people believe it's nonsense because we haven't seen it and we're claiming that it makes up a, you know 85% of the mass of the, of the universe in the form of matter and you idiot physicists are claiming that this exists and there are legitimate physicists who say no, what actually is happening is that at incredibly large scales, the scale of a galaxy, um, that gravity actually has to be deviated from the way that Newton taught us that things behave as inverse square. It's actually a little bit different from an inverse square law. Or, or that F doesn't equal MA. So the force mm, on an object yeah. normally equals its mass, this crystal, magic crystal that we still need to talk about, has some mass, some, you know, maybe 100 grams, and it's in an Earth's gravitational field. It will accelerate 9.8 meters per second every second. No, they say no. Actually, at very low accelerations, far below 9.8 meters per second squared, we're talking like fractions of a billionth of a meter per second squared, because these things operate on such large scales that if the if the gravitational force were much stronger than that, if the modification were stronger than that, um, they would be going faster than the speed of light given mm. the age of the universe. So these have to be very low accelerations, but we can't test low accelerations on Earth because the mass of gra the Earth is too big, even though it's weak, gravity is weak, it still is too big to see this microscopic trillionth of the gravitational force field on Earth. But they say, no, if you modify Newton's laws, not Einstein, forget about Einstein, you modify Isaac Newton's laws, you can actually account for dark matter without any new particle. You get the, you get the behavior of these galaxies and clusters of galaxies that astronomers have reported for the last 100 years. So that's an alternative. Now, that's partially why colleagues are shooting lasers at the moon because they want to test not on Earth because the Earth's gravity is too strong and not on the moon because the moon's gravity is too strong, but in the space time between the Earth and the moon and look for small deviations between the Newtonian behavior mm. and this proposed modified Newtonian dynamics called MOND. Uh, it's sort of, it, it may have some relevance to what Claudia Durham talked about here with the gravity has a mass. That blew my mind. It is. Uh, it's actually much more plausible, in fact, that gravity is modified on, on intergalactic distances than that gravity has a mass. Can you 
Say that in English. Okay. So what Claudia is claiming is that on the entirety of the entire cosmos, gravity may not propagate at the speed of light. Gravity may propagate slower because it's not actually caused by massless particles called gravitons. It's a modified version of that that propagates because anything that has mass cannot travel at the speed of light. Therefore, in her mind, these gravity claudions or whatever the particles are in her, in her model, they travel slow, slightly slower than the speed of light. Uh, it's harder to test that because you essentially need the entirety of the cosmos to test that. Whereas with dark matter, the claim is it's in it's in this room right now. Like the gravity of the dark matter, yeah, it's in the room with you right now. You know, it's calling from <laughs> it's here. It's calling from your. Where living. did it right. touch you? Exactly <laughs> right. Where Point did to the spot on the teddy bear? <laughs> where did the dark matter hurt you? So because of all these features, it's actually easier to falsify, which is a good thing, the dark matter hypothesis. That said, we haven't falsified it yet. But these people are shooting lasers at the moon. Again, I'm trying to come back to why do we believe the moon landing happened? Not only do the you know does is it true that that people are testing the precision with thinner than this to accuracy better than the thickness of this meteorite, they're actually testing it for reasons to prove this prevailing model wrong. In other words, there are also kind of conspiracy theories. They want to prove that no, gravity is not what Newton said it is. It has to be modified from what Newton said it was. It's a good thing. But to do that, they're actually accidentally proving that the moon landing happened. As is the the fact you made a psychological kind of appeal to, or sociological appeal. You said, isn't it weird that no one went back in 50 years? Okay, well, here's an example. So from society where we, the exact same thing happened, immense amounts of resources were expended, lives were lost, um, people, you know, economies were diverted to doing this whole project. Wait, now, lives were lost? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, a lot on the of way lives there. Were lost. Yeah, 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 and the moon yep, too. Yep, we yep, lost yep. a lot of astronauts yep, died. Yep. Right. Um, not you know not not too many thankfully, but but um, and then all these things were were made, and even things they don't dispute. Like again, they're using telecommunications. We have satellites. We have things that are on the moon that were placed there. They won't dispute that. So this is a long-winded way of saying that the more different directions you have to explore a scientific claim. The harder it is to falsify it. Thank you guys for checking out this clip. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe and hit the like button on this video. It is a huge, huge help. And if you'd like to check out this clip's full podcast episode, that link is in the description below or right here. And finally, you can follow me on Instagram and X by using the links in my description below.